Good evening, everybody. Hello and welcome to Donegal Railway Heritage Centre. Delighted to have you here uh, on Facebook and YouTube to uh, take part in this talk about the Londonderry and Lost Willie Railway. Uh, Jim McBride, one of my fellow directors here, is going to give us a talk and go through a slideshow of some pictures and give us some of the history. So if we bring Jim on to the stream now. Good evening, everybody. There we have Jim. I hope everybody can hear us. And uh, with Jim now, we'll get cracking with the slideshow. Okay. Okay. Okay, everybody, we're going to hand you, we're going to take a little journey. To Burtonport, Fab and Crab. Um, we're going to look at the line that first of AC63 between Derry and Bunkrana and the branch to Farland Point. So, uh, the first slide, please, the map. And the map here will show you the line as built. Is there, this, it looks like it's a fast date railway. It already had nearly 100 miles of track, but only owned about 25 miles of them. So, already the network three times bigger than the railway itself. And, okay, as the, the map shows you, there's a line running from Derry to Bunkrana up to Cardona. Cardona, the, the line between Bunkrana and Cardona was one of the first lines as early as 1935. First photograph, please. We're going to start our journey in Derry. Derry was a fast eating city for railways. It had four different terminal stations, and of, of two on each side of the river. And this one I was writing about would be the worst terminal station in Derry, and we'll see why shortly later. If you stood there today, that photograph was taken dock station. That's in the Strand Road, just like St. Lord Market, beside Sainsbury's car park today. Um, this shows you um, a, a special train in the summer of 1952. At that time, the English enthusiasts started coming over because they knew this railway was its last legs as a railway company. So it continues as a bus company until just four, just, just four years ago. Next slide, please. So, because see, it's funny, even though it's funny there were already diesel wheel cars on like the Donegal Railway, it's funny there no attempt to save the railway. They used steam engines right to the end. And Donegal used rail cars to diversify. It's funny they tend to replace their rail services by bus services. Next slide, please. And number 15 in July, June 1952. And here's a view of Greenwood Dock Station looking towards the city centre. Um, at that time, it had a roof still. What was the, the freight lines onto the harbour lines at the, at the key side, the London Dairy Port and Harbour Commissioner's lines? And that's where your Smith's um, toy store is today. Next slide. See, I want to thank anybody whose photographs we've used tonight. We've tried to credit them where possible. Um, some come from private collections. And what we have here is a photograph here of number again, the June 1952. Um, the first of eight four six two tanks supplied the Swally as early as eighteen ninety nine. No other railway in Ireland used the four six two tanks. The Swally had eight of them, of four different designs. Behind the wall was a connection to the Port of Harbour Commissioner's lines that had six miles of lines along the quays of Derry. Today you'll drive over to the jewel. Next slide, please. Now, Swally was a very you know, unique railway in many ways. Because so we have an orange here of the number 15. Now, that's well, that's where Sainsbury's car park is today. That may be hard to believe or credit. So the left is the Strand Road. And the only thing surviving that whole photograph is the hospital that left still there today. Uh, people in Derry would know better as wheelers. So what we have is number 15. In the very end, there's you know, four goods, of the three or four goods trains daily on the swally. Even at the very end, Karen, how are you sorry? With two trains a day from Letterkenny alone, two and from Letterkenny, carrying cross border traffic. Next slide, please. So, in, into the Swally Coast area, it's August 1953. An RFU here is showing you a, a train to the Green Dog Station. 
Um, it shows you looking from the station itself. And there's the buildings on the Strand Road today. And that scene is completely unrecognisable today, apart from the housing that left. Number 10 is yet another of the 462 tanks that Swinney seems to specialise in, unlike any other railway. It's only all 2642 tanks. The Swinney had to be different. They had 462 tanks instead. Number 10 also survived to the very end until 1953 and was built by Kerr Stewart in 1902. Next slide, please. Now, what we're going to look at next is an overview of, of the station in Derry and it's the interior. Um, some, as I read in a book recently, it describes the word. Uh, we can see why. Um, Although a report I read from 1949 described how the cattle were just being walked through the station on the way to the docks just to save time. So it was being treated like a jam cattle around a passenger station. And indeed, um, when they said they spent £500 upgrading the station, one money on, because it hadn't changed one bit. The next slide, please. We're we'll start looking towards get away from Derry and go towards Pennyburn. Pennyburn. The railway crossed the road on a level across the Strand Road. Pennyburn was one of the workshops of the railway were. And with this photograph from 1932, which is an unpublished photograph, that shows you the Strand Road running in Chen. So, where that large building is, which is gone today, it's now um, somewhere called McDonald's, so you may know it. And that's Pennyburn Shed, which is number 13 on the left and number 10 on the right. Yet again, two different types of 462 tank. Number 13, the left, was the last sign to deliver in 1910. They were filled with extra water and coal capacity because they were designed to work the Burton Port line, that fantastic line that we'll look at towards the end of our presentation tonight. And you see yourself as a much bigger locomotive than number 10, and yet there was very little difference between them in reality, except number 13 had a larger water and coal capacity. Next slide, please. We're going to look a bit more around Pennyburn. Pennyburn was where they suddenly had their workshops. The suddenly also kept a large number of coaches at the very end. And they t this was in 1948. And they kept the coaches for the summer excursion traffic, even though they, they, they closed the you know, line to regular pasture services as early as 1940. This was revived during World War II. And so sort of crowds between 1949. After that, in the summer months, people at Derry loved to go to Bacrana for a day out. And they got the Swilly coaches. The Swilly never bothered to bother, you know, the six wheel coaches, you know, most of them six wheel coaches, they had no heating, they were very basic. The Swilly never really cared for the customer of their passengers, the customer of the passengers. And these coaches would lie all year round at Pennyburn and be brought back to use for, for a nice summer day out for the people at Derry and their families, the Montana and out for the day, especially on a Sunday. Next slide, please. The next slide shows you another aspect of the Pennyburn Works. And the Pennyburn Works, um, so what we have here is the train from Graven Dock approaching Pennyburn. It's just crossed the Strand Road. Um, so when I never had legal permission from, from 1869 to 1918, for nearly 60 years, they had no permission for trains to cross the Strand Road. Just done illegally. Until 1918, when the family got permission, they said they couldn't afford to build a new terminus. And there's supposed to be horse, horse work, never happened. But this way, you know, seemed to have a very easy going relationship with the law. And this is a pair of from, you know, going from Bacrana, crossing into Pennyburn. And Pennyburn was a station, but it was for staff. Next slide, please. Same word, Pennyburn was the headquarters of the Swally. That's where they maintained their locomotives. And also their buses. That's why really famous for a number of things. They had the largest ever engines to run the Irish and our gauge. For the last engines are quite scarce. Number 12 survived to the very end. So really, it wasn't used very much after 1907. It was a 480. No other railway in Ireland had a 480. Swally had two of them. The Swally seemed to specialise in buying pairs. Uh, and then the 1930s came. One engine was withdrawn to keep the other one running. And this is magnificent tree shows in the 4 0 And these were ideal engines for the Burtonport extension, almost 75 miles of railway from Derry to Burtonport through Dedder County. And they were tender engines. No other railway in our gauge railway in Ireland used tender locomotives. In our gauge railway in Ireland needed tender locomotives. 
These were superb engines, as a great play at despite late attempts at number 12 was not, was not saved, because the sister locomotive, number 11, has went as early as 1933, though I'm sure large bits of number 11 kept number 12 going to the very end. Next slide, please. Sway is also famous, not for it, fours, did the largest tank engines on the Irish narrow gauge, which were bigger than most broad gauge narrow, the most, most broad engines. Number five was built in 1905. I was a 484. So it was built in 1912. It was a 484 built specifically for the Burton Port extension. These engines would probably never, ever work to their capacity. They were powerful. This is lovely for us in the summer of 1932. To the driver or maybe the farmer all in the locomotive. It gives you a great perspective of the size of these locomotives. If you look at the man, you'll see how, just how big these engines really were. Behind the locomotive, that wooden hut was actually the headquarters of the Ox Valley. And right up until a few years back, there used to be models of both the 480 and the 484 tank inside that hut. I would love to know where they were. If anybody out there knows where they are, please contact the Donegal Railway Heritage Centre. We would love to find them a new home. Next slide, please. So these were the biggest engines ever seen in the Irish Narrow Gauge. Yet again, it's a great pity one was not preserved. Yet again, there was very late attempts made by the Belfast Transport Museum to do so, but it didn't happen. What we have here is a very rare photograph. The Swilly really upgraded all the local motors between 19, 1899 and 1912. When the Swilly converted the three-foot gauge in 1885, they bought a couple of local motors second-hand or from anybody's odds and ends. Well, here's a little 060 tank from that period, and it used to be named in a show -in. If you look carefully, you can see the dents in the side tanks where the name plates have been removed in the late 1920s, according to what I can find out, and this photo dates in 1932. So this little 060 tank um, was, at this stage, over 50 years old. At this stage, it was really the works pilot at Pennyburn. I was used to shunt wagons along the quays to, to and from the dock lines in Derry. And this engine survived in 1940. Who first suggested very little work after about 1937. Next slide, please. We're going to be out to Wayne Pennyburn towards Bridge End. Now, Bridge End, you know, the Swilly, after partition 1921, the Swilly crossed into Irish Republic. The Swilly has left almost 100 miles of railway, which is only four miles inside Northern Ireland. There's lots of photographs of, of, of Bridge End because that's where the customs check carried out. So there's an ideal chance the English photographers. Like J.J. Smith, who we owe a particular thank to for his photographic memories, and thanks to the Blue Bell Ray Museum for letting us use his photographs tonight as well. He took a superb pictorial record of the last year of the Swilly. We see number 15, you know, waiting, and the white well, was good training for the customs checks we completed. And you just see beyond that car where the signals are, and then that's where the level crossing was, and that's where the main road, rich end to burn food, would cross. The line Swally Railway, and you still identify today where it is still say very clearly. It's a lovely little shot, and JJ Simpson took some really, took some really lovely atmospheric photographs. Number 15, despite his number, was the oldest of the 464 tanks, and I've been mean, originally numbered number five, as we numbered 1915 for accountancy reasons. Next slide. You, Bridge ends, as I said, just over the border in County Donegal. I just be on Bridge James, a station called Tuban Junction. If you went there today, you'd find a mini forest because Tuban Junction was a unique station in Ireland, like Manila Junction. They were in the timetable, they had service, but they had no road access. They were for staff use only. And Tuban Junction contained this fantastic signal box, completely unlike any other signal box that Swilly had. And Tuban Junction was where the line from Letterkenny and Burncraft joined and shared the same track in the dairy. You went there today, you, good luck to you, because it's, it's like a mini forest. I was see number 15 waiting, and trains changed crews there, changed shunted wagons there, so it was always time for a photograph. Nobody was ever in a rush to Swally. You know, as long as you had plenty of time, the Swally was your railway. The next slide. Uh, good we mentioned Bridge End as earlier. I'll go look at Bridge End Station. This is one thing the Donegal Railway. They never had brake bands for their goods trains. So the very end, like at Donegal, 
you know, there's always a brake coach at the end of the train. Like it's only go, oh, they never use tail lamps at the end of the train. We see the the, the the little plate on the back of the brake van. The signifying that was the end of the train. The brake the coach, the brake coach consists of you know, plenty of room for the guard and the parcels and the meal. And a couple of compartments for any passenger brave enough or plenty of time to get from Derry to Moncrana by rail. And the interesting thing is, there was some reason the splitting rail tickets between Derry and Moncrana were cheaper than their bus tickets. Don't know because it took two hours to get there rather than an hour. Who knows? But it must be a fascinating journey to go back there. J.J. Smith did 1952 and travel from Derry to Moncrana. And everybody's splitting. You're always made welcome. Just hop on board. Once you're not in a rush, you can get the train. Don't worry about that bus. Get the train. What a, what a truly fascinating railway. Next, please. To mention earlier, Tubin Junction was where the, the line from Letter Kenny joined with the line from Macrana. And we know that Brains 1852, we see number 10 the goods from, from Macrana. Shot they were number 15 on the goods to Letter Kenny. And so this place will know where we come to life. The trains would meet, crews sometimes change. Parcels have sometimes changed, and I guess we go back in the slumber again for hours before another train arrives. Tuba Junction is basic island platform, but if you get off there, you'd be in trouble. There, there's no road. There's a very basic footpath that the, the signal man used to get this back the road to Inch and Fawn. Right, please. So Tuba Junction is a fascinating place, and Anybody's got photographs recently, please get in touch with us. We're looking for any good photographs of the junction today. Okay, we're going to go to the line to Macrana first of all. Okay, the first station was Inch Road. This is a, uh, thanks to the Huey Station's website for supplying this photograph I, I, I Irish editor of. Uh, it shows you that there's a passenger loop and a good sighting. And in, photographs of Inch Road Station are very, very scarce. It's one of the very few I've ever seen. The oldest and the building to the right was the goods store, and there's a few sightings here. And oh, it wasn't the past that you could, in theory, like Inver, pass the train if required. Okay, next slide. Move on down a bit. There's a couple of little stations between Tube and Junction and Macrana, and these stations seem to be very rarely photographed, apart from Fall. Um, so this is Fall Station from 1953. And it shows you the station building. And the station building and all still there today. This is various incarnations of homes and restaurants. And falls the place you look very carefully. You see that the bridge still survives, the building still survives, as indeed does the original engine shed upon and parts of the pier. So I um it's well worth a visit once things start to ease off later this year, hopefully, post COVID. And it's a fascinating little place to spend an hour or two. Next slide, please. There's really an awful lot of stations in a short distance, and they seem to put a station or a halt in just anywhere where anybody lived to try and get to. One of the lesser known ones was Beach Halt on the approach of a mile from Buncrana. And this is open to say it's 1939. They try and get data to give easier access to the beach of Buncrana or the White Strand. If you stand there today, as a road, there's a hotel, and recognize that place they one bit. I think they've been played for uh, E.M. Parson. E.M. Parson, we all of gratitude. He wrote the first histories of both the Donegal Railway and the Lough Swally. And thanks him, we know so much about both of these fascinating Nargis railways of the North. Next slide, please. So we're we'll, we'll going to go on to Macrana now and learn a bit more about it. Now, what is great about doing this is just the Things turn up as you don't expect. We're currently researching for duties. I'm researching with Paul Wright, the history of the line Derry to Moncrana and Letter Kenny. And this photograph turned up, and myself and Joe Berry has also written books this way and the Donegal had good discussions about this. Well, I had a railway as early as 1863. And between 1863 and 1885, that was five foot, a five foot three gauge railway. Okay, that was the Irish broad gauge. And in 1885, the line from Derry to Buncrana was converted to a three foot gauge. Okay, now this is this this is Buncrana station pre 1900, 
And we say for dead number reasons. Firstly, it's an hour gauge train. So it's starting 1885, 1890. This is how you do your work. 1885, 1889. We can tell that's a very basic terminal station. It later on became a through station, the line of Cardona's opened in 1901. Work had taken place up in 1899, so it's certainly, pre, certainly in the area of Queen Victoria, which Queen Victoria was the Queen of both England and Ireland. We can tell by, by looking at it carefully, you know, one of the 060, one of the 060, early 060 tanks named London Derry. This used to cause great confusion in the Derry. People will see the name of the engine and think the train was going to Derry, but really, Crana, even London Derry. So it's a very rare for a certain thing of the locks, probably really up on Trana. And it probably dates by eyes and even the very basic signalling on the right hand side. But behind the train is what's what, Crana Station. They built a lovely station building. And it'd be just great to go back in and pay it a visit sometime soon, because it's now in the drift in and get a nice pint and a bowl of stew. We can dream that the next few months things will change. But it shows you what well, a fantastic old photograph of a Crana station that is. Next slide, please. Okay. As I said, Bunkrana was the terminus between, you know, for the 1863 and 1901. And it became a junction of the current, 1901, 1935. Some photographs, but they were just too poor to show tonight. So that's our next task. Here's a nice view of Bunkrana, Bunkrana Station looking towards the town centre. Okay. You can see the station building on the left. You see the good sheds, the good yard. Seven more, the Swally, you know, this is towards Derry. The Swally was a very busy railway, you know, right. The Swally is a very busy railway. Okay. Very busy, a lot of traffic, a lot of freight traffic. And, you know, to kill the passenger traffic off the, the Bukhara, they had to buy double decker buses in 1949. Until the end, they, they couldn't carry the passengers from Derry Bukhara in the summer months. Eventually, in the month of Lurie, they could get the goods traffic switched over by August 1953. But it's a nice photograph of the station. Um, it's very spacious, which will explain the reason shortly. Next slide, please. What is Bukhara from this period? I'm going to look at an overview of the station. And now we have the train to Derry about to depart. Note the width between the platforms. The local was always called the Condona platform. Okay? That's the platform out of the station 1801 when the lines extend from Bukrana to Condona through Valley Devon, etc. Um, there was a footbridge behind the train at the, at the town centre end of the station that could connect the, the Condona platform to the main platform, which the original platform of the station dated back to 1863. And you tell because they originally built a five foot three railway, there's plenty of room for a middle track there. But then, of course, in Donegal, land was cheap. You could build a big station, didn't cost you much. And there's a photograph of, uh, you know, it shows you number 10. Number 10 became the engine like sort of commonly used in the Macrana line, on the Macrana line right to the very end. Number 10 was kept for the morning goods, the regular engine, six days a week, the morning goods, the Macrana, the dairy and back. But they didn't keep a crown towards the end. They kept the engine and fawn with the little shed there. Because the crew lived in fawn. So it's easy to keep their little engine, which they kept absolutely immaculate at the very end. To the better than somebody's prized car. And this engine was kept in the little shed of fawn right to the end. Crown engine. And behind the early Swilly buses. And the Swilly converted. Started convert the, the buses as early as 1931. And as well as one of the few railway companies in Europe, and the only one the British Isles operate both rail, bus, and steamship services, because they ran boats as well from Fulham across the Rathmullen, etc. 
the summer months. The swelling was truly unique, really, in many ways. Um, the ready to depart, and it's also a summer. Just with number enthusiasm, and they came across to sample what was truly a unique railway, and we're so grateful they did because special railway. Next slide, please. Now we're going to look at a few more photographs of Ukraine before we start to really explore. Okay. Now, most photographs of Ukraine are taken looking towards the town centre. Okay. This is taken in the town center looking towards Derry. All those buildings, the building on the left, the station building still survives today, as does the water tower to the right, and there's a good shed just behind, behind the photographer. It's the summer of 1948. I showed you a good view. The plan was curving around here, because behind where the photographer is standing, the line went across the main road from Bacran to Derry, and towards Condona. That line only lasted years and close there is as 1935 you see the footbridge in the station which was seen in the earlier photograph and a fair amount that station still survives today and it's very easy for us i guess you can really begin to what the swelling will look like as a railway in its heyday the wide space between the platforms is the short gateway that's used to be a five foot three railway and of those things, today, the station building still survives today as a well-known pub and restaurant in Bunkra. And if anybody's ever over and this part not, it's certainly a recommend to pay a good visit, a visit sometime. I see the, the locks fully in that station building. Next slide, please. So, we're looking at our rear photograph this way. Most people take photographs at the station. Uh, you said you wouldn't recognize this spot today. I've got to try and find it maybe next month. A number two. two. As he heading there going past, head approaching Golf Links Hall beside the golf course in Crana. Yet again, when it tells the summer excursion train, because after 49, regular trains of a months to carry the fuel. But Derry, for the of a day out of Macrana, or a nice cream, or a nice pint of Guinness, or whatever. Okay? This is helping number train seven number two was one of four four six oh tanks built by Barclay in eighteen oh one and they were known and they were built for the Burton Port extension. Okay. But in reality they're probably they were probably too small. But the regard is probably the best inch so the best inches and they also also we find the Montana line. The, the, the smaller coal and water capacity in the 463 tank. They were very useful and very economical engines, and two of them survived to the very end in service, number two and number three. And they were built by Barclays. And what's also at the front is the buffer beams, unlike most other engines, didn't have any curves. They had just rectangular buffer beams, and that's an easy way to identify one of the Barclay tanks. The early engines curved edges with the buffer beams in the front of the bus to allow easier access to. So, number two is going to lead the Macrana line. It's going back to Derry, and we're going to lead the Macrana line for a short while. We're going to head back to Two Band Junction. But the line Derry to Macrana was only a few stretches owned completely by the Swilly. Indeed, the only stretch of line owned completely by the Swilly. Support. Or maybe 80% of their network was lines they operated, but they such so as the line we'll look at next, from Tubman Junction to Letterkenny. Now, when Swilly was first opened in 1863, the line from Tubman Junction continued to Farland Point. Farland, where the Swilly built their first pier, the ferry stocks Swilly. Next slide, please. But the ferry serves the locks Swilly towards Rathmullen, the centre. 
Four point didn't prove very successful. That's one. Okay. So short of the branch line in 1863, then we'll crack the crown in 64. As early as 1866, the Swiss decided to close the line from Tubman Junction, temporarily operating it by horsepower, by horses. The Swiss would do anything to save money. In 1877, the railway was lifted, but later on, part of the railway was re reused to, come, to connect what became the letter Kenny Valley, Trolley Embankment. Through Newton County and Mountain County, and it was only 1883. The Larry Kenny Railway was built from the very beginning. So, for two years, Two Man Junction became a strange space where on the left hand side is the three foot gauge railway that terminated Two Man Junction. He changed there the five foot three, five foot three railway to Derry from Bacrana to Derry. And we're going to also take a journey down the Burton Port Extension. We've got some grass before in public of the Burton Port Extension, which is a major achievement because the Burton Port Extension was closed completely beyond the door by July 1940. First slide, please. So now we're going to take you away from Derry and take you through the wilds of Donegal, go to Letter County first of all, and Letter County, in those days, is recognizable compared to the town of Letter County today. So we're very probably at Two Band Junction. We're going north. Okay, the line on the left is going towards Letter Kenny. The line on the right is going towards Moncrana. So down the line on the left from from Truman Junction, which is one of the few lines stationed in the loop without road access. The only other line I think was Junction on the Balna branch. This the very end. Because you're a very different that are kind of going really. Next slide, please. Photographs of these intermediate stations are quite rare. After I put the slideshow together, I was given the rough photograph of, of this station we'll look at next, Sallyburg Station. But no. By the time I got it, Mark and myself looked great at the slideshow. Most stations on the line between Tim and Jones and Kenny were built at a very short, the very typical, a large substantial house that was both the station, station building, and the house of the station master, so that saved cost, and a pretty clear station site. And the latter days, but they were only open for one or two trains a day, and these goods trains always carried a coach. So after August 1940, Cybrook saw no regular passenger trains. And the only way you would turn up, you find out the local guy at the station what time the goods train was due for Letter County, and you get the goods train. And if you lost an hour to the spur, then, then life was fine. You're in Donegal time and just you'll get there. Just don't ask, don't worry about it. Next one, please. The most important station on the line between Tumen Junction and Larry Kenny was the station in Newton Cunningham. Not only the service were more, some were more substantial, Newton Cunningham, even in the last days, twice a day after World War II of the closure, they were bursting into life. Because the train, the goods in Letter Kenny to Derry arrived in Newton County, and the train would arrive in Newton County with the goods from Derry to Letter Kenny. The crews would exchange, sometimes the locals would exchange, and there wasn't any great rush about things. Okay, and this is my Ernie's Ruby Archive, and Ernie, I really thank Ernie's Ruby Archive for being so kind, supplying this to go with the Center for the use of so many. He has acquired. In particular, the ACC Castle collection. I will see the water come because usually in Newton County, you have time for a chat, a cup of tea, the engine take water, you took, the engine took water, the crew took water. Sometimes they, they maybe took water from the, the pub nearby as well. 
Those are different times than the days we live in today. So on the station, there's the goods van. There's the brake van. That was the end of the train. Wagons in the background. And a group of enthusiasts have turned up the swally bird out. And I'm glad they did because they took some great photographs. They some permanent memories. Next slide, please. Say before, Jim and I were bursting the life twice a day. The very end, there were two good trains, say, Derry, Larry Kenny, and vice versa. And here's another one, shows you a typical swilly type station. That's number 15. Number 15 tend to be the regular goods engine. It was the last swilly engine to get a full overall as late as 1951. Um, somewhere around World War II, it acquired a bell power firebox as well. But because I no one's really sure when that. But 45 acquired a bell power firebox, probably from one of the large 462 tanks, 13 or 14 was seen earlier. So if you see yourself, the train and the crews are crossing, and sometimes the engines change changed over as well. Next slide. We did Union Cunningham Station from the early 1950s, from June 52. It's a great photograph. Show this photograph to, to Mark, our chairman, and Al, our manager. A superb thanks to the Armstrong Blue Photographic Trust for yet again agreeing to this year. And what we have here, you can see yourself. Well, let's, let's, let's start from the left hand side. The left hand side, you see the station building we seen earlier. In front of the station building site, the train to Derry, you can see the signal car. So you may have business in Donegal Town at the Hurley Centre. Maybe you do once things reopen in the next month or two. And if you're a visitor in the Hurley Centre and you want to spend a penny, you go to, you go to visit the loo at the Donegal Hurley Centre. It's actually in the toilet. It's actually the, the toilet is actually the original signal box building and structure from Newton Colony Station. Did it kindly to the family who lived there to be two decades ago? On the right hand side, you see the water tower, which was the main water tower. And you see the logos taking water and throwing off and building up steam to take the train to Letter Kenny. That's a superb photograph. It really is. It just sums, like even say it's 1952, the swelling could create a little bit of miniatures from England. And I'm glad they, the photographs. Therefore, Newton County is an important station because the trains crossed there and they continued their journey to and from Letter Kenny. Letter Kenny is more than doubled in size in the last two decades, let alone the 1950s. And certainly, Letter Kenny being the size it is today, in those days, there's no way that the railway would have closed. It would have stayed open somehow. But those were different times. Now, Letter Kenny said, Where was it? It was the, the terminus of the Swally branch and two injunctions of the letter Kenny. And letter Kenny is locked on station. As did the county, next slide. As did the county Donegal. Kenny was a major town, a major centre of goods traffic. Goods traffic at letter Kenny was. Very, very heavy. Okay. And what we have here is the field spot this afternoon. Shed that Kenny. And this is on the turntable. That's number eight on the turntable. Next slide, please. You sit there today, you're in the middle of the summer car park with so market. You stood in that same spot. Today. Letter Kenny, they were at the, the Swally station. Letter Kenny was this in, in County Donegal, which are two separate rail stations. Only at Letter Kenny, you had the Donegal station and you had the Swally station. I am not know it because it's now the bus station. Here we see number three. Number three called the lovely little Barclay 460 tanks. And this is the bottom of Letter Kenny station, the goods to Derry. As usual, the goods of Derry contain the very back, carefully, one of the, the, the brake coaches. So, if you're an extra R2 to kill, you're no great rush. 
The bus would take an hour, the train could take two hours, three hours, who knows? But you enjoy the journey. That was the magic that was funny. Next slide, please. So, well, there again, it's a very important station. This was also where the Lock Swally had a county Donegal Railway. The two seasons were adjacent. And then for about a mile into Derry, the two seasons ran basically parallel to each other. Today, you wouldn't know where you were because the, 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 it's not a very busy dual carriageway. And it's always busy at heavy times of the year. Here's a lovely shot of Derry County Station with the J.J. Smith connection of the Blue Bell Railway. You see them in that. You see them with way of getting photographs. He stood back and got loving photographs of the scenery around him, the station, the architecture, the signalling, and the trains in the middle of it. But the, the, the things around it, like the station building, station buildings, the signalling, gives you an idea of the atmosphere of the Swally station. So even though regular passenger services ceased as early as the summer of 1940, regular daily passenger services. You can still get you in 20, as long as you're prepared to take a few hours to get better than the dairy, rather than get the Swilly bus. So the Swilly would get you there one way or the other, but it was cheaper by train. Was it really worth, worth, worth seeing the fuel pence for an extra hour of your journey? Who knows? We're going to look at another, next slide, please. We're going to look at another photograph of the station itself here. Here's a lovely shot of Larry County Station from 1948. It's taken that engine shed we've seen slightly earlier, looking towards the station and the town centre. You take that photograph today, you're in the middle of a huge supermarket car park. You see the water tower on the right. You see a turntable, because the swelling always turned their engines very religiously at the end of each journey. You see a typical swelly signal cabin, a very unique slanted style, unlike any other really I've ever seen in my life. We see a substantial good chart. And the local board of shunting the good chart is number five. Number five, we see there is one of the huge 484 tank engines that survived at the very end. And indeed, one of the engines that was used to lift the swelling. Only last week, I was in the photographs of the lifting train from 1954. I had a time to get in the slideshow, but I do aim to use these slides and others, like the ones I couldn't use, for a book later on this year, which I'll tell you about later on tonight. Shows you the extensive goods yard. There's enough traffic from the, 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 the rural hinterland around Denner County to give two goods trains a day from Denner, from Denner County to Derry right up to closure. And remember, if you weren't happy with the Swally, you could send them to the Donegal Railway to Strand and Derry instead. And Denner County, you had the choice to get to a few places in the northwest. We had two different routes between one place and Derry itself. Next slide, please. I said before about number five. Number five will be huge 484 tank engines. You know, it's hard to imagine there's, and, and they survived then, along with number 15. Number 15 did back to 1899. Number 15 is outside the shed in Little Kenny. And the last few years, number 15, judging by the photographs, of 1951 to 53, number always seem to do the good in the morning. Derry to Letter County and back. That seemed to be its regular turn. That engine had a regular crew, and the regular crew kept that engine cleaner. You know, the, uh, the, um, anybody house proud would keep their house, or a car owner would keep their car. Those engines sparkled, and we'll see later on some very rare color photographs showing you what I'm telling you is correct. Next slide, please. We're going to have one more slide letter, Kenny, and then start to head down the infamous and legendary Burton Port extension. Here's our lovely photograph of one of the 484 tanks. At this stage, they're just already changing Derry and Letter Kenny. Those engines can you know, can haul what trains up to 60 wagons or more. I doubt whether they were ever really tested in their lives. And yet, despite the huge wheel range, they were ingeniously designed so they were very light on the track. Because the weight was spread across the eight couple of wheels. So also the science way they can negotiate in sharp curves and sidings and whatever. They can negotiate a very sharp curve. And one of these is overall weight is 1949. 
and we'll see if we're about later. And they were used to lift the railway and finally from Derry to from Derry by 1954 after 70 after 70 years of service. Now we're going ahead and this book which some of you may have heard of the old center. Uh, it's a history of the line from Derry to Burtonport, written by Frank Sweeney. Uh, if you haven't got a copy, it's worth, it's worth tracking down, because it is some fantastic stories. Next slide, please. From Derry to Derry to Burtonport was a fantastic railway. It's about 50 miles. If you built it direct, it would be about 30 miles with the crow flies. It's famous for a number of things. It's the infamous Owen Carroll Fadot. Owen Carroll Fadot crossed a very lonely, remote place to north of Derrick County. In the winter of 1965, the famous accident took place when, the, when the, the train was blown off the van, literally during a, gale, uh, uh, during a severe, severe windstorm. Okay? And the famous Owen Carroll Fadot accident. accident. And he lost their lives. And after that, there they had to introduce ammeters to measure the winds. And to get geological waters, especially check the wind speed, especially during the winter months. And they also put you know, large stone weights inside using the brake van or whatever with the goods train crossing the van out, sort of hold it down so the wind wouldn't literally blow it off the blow it the nowhere like happened in the winter's night in 1925. This photograph is from a train in April 1940. It's taken looking toward, as, as the train is heading towards Burtonport. These photographs come, into, come to mind. I've been able to get access to these recently thanks to Ernie and the same uncle John J. Dewey. Now, what an Englishman was doing in Donegal in April 1940 when Britain was at war with Nazi Germany, who knows? And the line closed only a few months later. These are probably the last good photographs we have seen. We'll, that were taken all the lines of birth were closed completely from Ecuador in 1947. And it shows you that Owen Carafada in a lonely exposed area, and that's where the train was blown off the rails literally in a winter's night in 1925, killing a few people. Next slide, please. This line was built. Um, it's like, it's, so I drew a line in the map, and we see the town or village, the swilly would go two miles away from it, so it didn't serve it. So usually most of these release two miles or more away from the town they served. This shows you number 14. Number 14 is one of the four six two tanks in the area of Pennyburn, one of the large final ones, with extra side tanks of water. So it's designed to operate you know, um, pasture trains reading the Burton Port extension. The bigger engines were able to use which were heavier. But these ones here managed on the road in the pasture train. April 1940, even this age, are still two passenger trains a day on the Burton Port line. One from Derry and one from Letterkenny. The one from Derry took six hours to get to Burton Port and five and a half on the way back. So it was an adventure also. And we're lucky this man, John J. Dewey, took these for us in April 1940. He's an Englishman, he's passed away many, many minutes ago. And thanks to Ernie for using these from his own personal collection. And it shows you the trains taking water. And you have plenty of time to get the photograph, chat to the crew, or the van at Pint and Burton Port or whatever. It was truly a legendary railway. 50 miles of railway through the wilds of Donegal. And over the 1903, closed completely by the summer of 1940, past Ecuador. Next slide, please. We're looking at all of the stations between Letterkenny and Burton Port. Very few photographs, please. This one's taken a cruise lock station. It's a lovely photograph. It shows you one of the four it oh engines it's number twelve we've seen earlier. It's a lovely side view. The engine's absolutely gleaming. So it must have just been through Pennyburn Works. It's totally spotted in the famous green livery of the swally. Um the trains taking goods or the crews taking water or of the Irish kind or different water, who knows? But time this this is the team of our great man, Henry Castley. Henry Castley, he's passed away, pushing many years ago. He took a superb photographic record of the Irish Way. Um, when his son passed away recently, some of these photographs were bought for posterity by Ernie, 
or the arms through your record society. And this is just, just a superb shot with the mountains of Donegal in the background. Next, please. We're going to move on towards the end of the line, Burtonport. And Burtonport, if you go there today, you still see traces of Ruby to this day. We have a superb shot, number 12. This is an arm from the team by H.C. Cassidy from Ernie's collection. Number 12 is getting badly, Burtonport. You see the tender behind the local, that kind of water and coal. They do the train quite easily. Certainly not cool to get to Letter Kenny. And water you get top up on route because there's plenty of places to stop, have a yarn, pass the time of day, and sure you get five and a half hours, six hours to get a dairy. Nobody's in a great rush. Obviously, there's a van being loaded up. So the three large fish vans were built. The largest wagons ever built in the Irish and Argus. One of these survived in the 1970s outside Bancrana. I remember very early attempts to save it. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. The largest ever wagons built in the Irish and Argus. Built for the fish traffic from Burtonport to take it to Derry. And we see one of these van, large vans behind the locomotive. We're we'll looking at a few more photographs of Burtonport and just go look at it. It's something a little different to finish our first night. Burtonport's a wild and remote place. And it was built to, because it was built was what the British government called the congested 1890s. Congested meant nobody lived there, only in Ireland. And these railways were built to try and create traffic, try and stop the population loss, try and keep people there, try and look these up areas up for access. And they built the line to Burtonport. It was built and paid for by the government for that reason. The line to Burtonport was even a separate company. You know, the Larry Kelly at Burtonport Railway Company, Burtonport Extension Railway. Next slide. And it was a separate railway company, the LBER. We had coaches lettered LBR, logos lettered LBR, and even wagons lettered LBR. Here we have number 14 for April 1940. The line will close just four months later. Number 14 shunt the train. One of the coaches, a passenger train. Now, it must be a great journey. Five and a half hours in a coach in the middle of winter with no heating and hard wooden seats. Truly, this really was an experience all on itself. Number 14 shunt the train. After the line closed in 1940, number 14 and 13, these two large tank engines were withdrawn. Number 14 is drawn in 1943. I reckon the spoiler probably end up in number 15. Keep it going to the very end. Next slide, please. I know I've already seen for Burtonport and I try to get stuff that wasn't seen tonight. This is a turntable. Okay, number 14 is a tank engine. Nobody wanted to go back to Larry County 50 miles bunker first. Number 14 is getting turned in April 1940. That the trace of the turntable was survived until relatively recently. Um, the engine itself would be withdrawn and scrapped in 1943 as part of the wartime economy drive. What I'm trying to do there is show you so many which were us in black and white of the locks Willie that I've collected over the last year or so. Um, I intend sometime this year, on behalf of the centre I'm on the committee, is produce a small booklet to raise funds for the centre, in particular our steam engine drumbo being restored at Whitehead. And hopefully the COVID restrictions are reason in the north and work will recommence in full and look over the So please watch out for this book, which I plan to write and produce for the centre. And all funds in this book was produced will be delayed towards the centre itself, in particular steam engine locomotive restoration fund. And that's why so many people tonight helped me with so photographs on the base that, we, that they're mentioned and thanked and that the work will be used towards preservation. I'm going to finish with a little journey in the swally. Remember, I closed August 23 and we're going to see the swally in colour the last six or so slides. So we'll look at the next slide, please. And colour for us in swally are very, very rare. And I've never seen more than about 30. Here's a shot of Vaughan looking towards Derry. The excursion trip to Burton to Bunkrana, um, taken by June 1950, and number 10, which was the pet engine in the Bunkrana line in the last few years, is taking the, the families families from Derry for a nice day out on the beach in Bunkrana. They got ice cream, 
the kids and a pair of guns to the dad and taking a phone station and a lot of that for us behind the engine train is the, the bridge carrying the road over the railway it still survives this day as the station down to the right. Next slide, please. The Swanee Paint Rose in a nice green livery, you know, number 10 seemed to have his own unique livery, the little things were applied to it. Number 10 team, the same photographer, shows you a train running alongside the beach, coming into Moncrana, between Fawn and Moncrana, at the near the, the Span and Strand, it's right beside the Swanee, and to the right of the Swanee, looking across towards the line, was now running away from Tumon Junction towards Letterkenny along the the embankment, I remember that line, the very house built in mainly reclaimed land. This stage, even the segment you know, is marked out of use. You know, because phones, signal blocks, and signals no longer used. And the, the token and two injunction, you had the last year, the whole way of yourself to Bunkrana. Superb shot taken from the road. And you were looking, you still see trace the right beneath the main road today. I know the councils on both sides of the board. Plan to create a green bank from the bridge end towards Moncrana using the old Swally track bed as a memory, as the council has already done around Burtonport. So, many thanks to Donegal County Council for A, protecting for a track bed, and B, remembering the heritage of County Donegal. Next slide, please. We're going to get the train to Moncrana. We're seeing Moncrana in black and white. And we've got a lovely photograph here from. Summer 1950, showing you number 10 of Moncrana. We're looking towards Derry. The mountains are behind you. Just look at the space of that station. Okay. Plenty of room. There's a good shed to the left behind you. The road is to the left of the footbridge. It's just a superb photograph. And it shows you, you know, the, the, how big the station was. The local one is spotless. The goods, goods wagons are behind you. Just sums up the car down the spur of the swelling. A few photographs to go. I'm going to head to Cut the Moncrana in, in the early 1950s. We're going to head back to one of the last years in operation on our next slide. So we'll return, take a retrace our steps back from Moncrana. We've had our day out. The kids have had an ice cream, dance with a pint, and everybody's happy. Number 10 is a two-man junction. On a special train that and there's a charter train because only at this stage the only trains that more than one coaches were trains hard and during the early 50s there were a couple of spar special trains as a far master train were hard out by different groups of English railway enthusiasts. And we're lucky it's one of the JM Jarvis collection and we thank the colour for being used to this. And she was number three at two in junction waiting to return to Derry. And number ten as if for seemed to be the pet engine the last few years. And the crew claimed that the train had better than they did their wives. And they kept the engine actually spotless and we shed it on for a wee day out, six days a week, to Bunkrana and back. Until their, old, their fun again ended later that year. June 53, the Swallow goes just two months later, on the 8th of August, 1953. Next slide. What we have here now is an hour shot with a bridge end. Number 10 is shunting the train. And the, the train season consists of a goods van and a brake coach. At the bridge end, they would shunt long wagons away at customs clearance. And what sometimes happened was that the wagons were coming back into Derry, they couldn't get cleared, they leave the bridge end, customs never finish their job off, and the next train from Letter County or Crana would bring the wagons into Derry later in the day. Nobody's rush, you know, cattle in the train couldn't complain as the train was in. They didn't care, they had their good nice little cattle van. Nor could the fish traffic complain. And you see this the dark green livery that Swally had at the very end. And the coaches and fans were getting a, 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 a dark grey livery. Luckily, saying one coach, one Swally coach still survives this day in the Foyle Valley Railway Centre in Derry. And that was preserved by a few people like good friends like George Hearn, George Sweeney, 20, 30 years ago and restored. Next slide. So we had their headquarters in Pennyburn. And it was right outside the chapel there in Bunkrana Road. There's number 15, June 1953. The engine is absolutely gleaming. Gleaming. 
you know, things that something reflected on the border and the local. That engine was built in 1899, lasted in order to come service. And the very last swell engine scrapped as late as Easter 1954. Yet again, unfortunately, the Belfast transfer has been set up. Some might have disputed over money. The swell engine tried to spur it at number five, but unfortunately, it wasn't saved. And the great pity, one of the unique swell 462 tanks wasn't, wasn't preserved at the end. And really, guys, that's that's my last slideshow. There's a couple of little things to tell you about, about the center. The next slide, please. So what I'm working on the Locks Valley Railway, Bukana, Derry, and from, for for the two stations. And that's where all these progress come from. We still at the center have a bit of a, a small number of these books left from 1996. And the visitors guide to London Railway with another superb color photograph of number three. At Bukrana Station in colour on the front cover. Please contact us, please support us. We want to bring a steam into back to all earlier this year, and we can't do that without your help and your support. I'm going to ask answer any questions, and um, there's already publications on sale at the centre. I think we have one more slide to go, Mark. And um, please contact us by Facebook or by email. Uh, Mark and Al will be too glad to help you support railway preservation in Donegal. We're not just about the Donegal Home County Donegal Railway, we're about the other great survivor, the Donegal Railway Heritage Centre. And here's some photographs of the Lock Swally book. And once it's reprinted, it won't be, and once it's got, they're gone, they're gone. The book won't be reprinted. As well as many black and white photographs, and what I try to show you tonight is many photographs, every percent of what you've seen tonight have not been seen in public before, ever. Okay, Jim, thank, thanks for that. Uh, apologies for the signs issues. Um, that was unfortunately Jim's internet connection. We were we had a bit of a panic beforehand because his internet had actually been down all day. So uh, we we got we got through it in the end. Um, if if you have any questions, just put them in the comments, and we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, I've got a couple here. Uh, Richard Devaney. Uh, asking if we have any photos of the train crossing the bridge at Waterloo Road to Treaty Bank after leaving Ban Junction for Burt. So I don't know if you've got any of those in your collection, Jim. Please send the, the centre, and we will gladly take them to the website. But we have a few, but they're not in, of great quality or condition. But we're going to try and get them improved for the book. But uh, also, they're looking for pictures for for Manor Manor Cunningham and Pluck Station. I'm sure we. Uh, we can certainly have a well, look through our yeah. archives. If you want to send an email to manager at denigalrailway dot com, we can have a look through and see if we've got anything. Or certainly, hopefully, if we're open during the summer and you're local, you can come in and we can have a look through the archives and see what we have. Marcus, three stations. So if you've any more questions, pop them in the comments. Manorcully and Pluck and Karoti, a very we'll few. We'll do our best. Us, very, very them. few. So, if I'm just going to put it up, apologies for please the sound. send us. Okay. Please send us if, we, if you've got any, because they're very scarce. I'm just going to check the comments. Uh, Column. Old Down Station Letter Kenny, we can certainly have a look through our archives and see. So if you drop an email to um, manager at denigallrailway.com, we can do our best to see what we can find. So thanks very much, guys, for tuning in. Um, if we don't have any more questions, I'll call it a halt there before the internet breaks completely. But thanks very much for tuning in. Do take a look at our website. Um, as you can see over here, we have plenty of publications to do with the railway. So please do give us a shout uh, if we're open during the summer. Have a look on our website, see what we have. And uh, thanks for tuning in. And there will be another talk coming up soon where um, I'll be giving a talk around the museum here with a little bit of history of the three railways that were in the county. Um, that will probably be on Easter Sunday at 7 o'clock. Time to be confirmed yet. 
But thanks for tuning in, guys. And thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.